Hello there, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. This is a full, long episode. It's Finland's biggest mystery, the Lake Bodum murders. I was actually just reading in the news today, someone hit me up on Twitter, as people often do. I, a while ago, made a video about the Dyatlov Pass incident, which is this, uh, I believe it was in, in, in Siberia, in Russia, might have been somewhere else in Russia, where a bunch of hikers went missing and their bodies were found and they had been attacked by like some scary beast or something and it turns out it might have been an avalanche and like some really specific sort of avalanche that caused this craziness and yeah so maybe that has actually been solved although they're not sure we could cover the dialov pass incident here on casual criminalist although it now seems like it would be more just natural event accidents rather than crime but uh anyway what happens here is uh, Callum has written me a script. I don't have the paper script in front of me because I'm being environmentally conscious slash I forgot to print it out this morning. So let's just crack on, shall we? Uh, Callum writes this for me. I shall read it. Uh, you shall listen or watch it, depending on where you get this show, whether as a podcast or as a YouTube video. If you are listening as a podcast, please do consider leaving us a review for this, this show. If you're watching on YouTube, please do uh, smash that like button. And shall we just crack on with it? According to my vast knowledge of world cultures, the people of Finland mostly spend their days cross-country skiing down the eastern border, keeping a lookout for Russian battalions. That sounds legit, and I 100% believe you, Callum. But I'm also informed that in their downtime, they also like to make the most of their country's vast, swa vast swaths of natural beauty. Finland is an outdoor paradise filled with dramatic mountains and vast lakes. There are more hunting, fishing, and camping opportunities than you could ever hope for. Today's case, however, might make you think twice about pitching your tent out in the forest. When I think of, like, safe countries, like Northern Europe always comes to mind. It's like, yeah, everything's really peaceful up there, right? I mean, I know it's, like, dark for a large amount of the year, but it, it seems very safe. Safe and expensive is kind of what I think about Northern Europe. Anyway. Outdoor adventure can turn to slasher movie terror in the blink of an eye, and with nobody around to help, the consequences can be horrific. I, I, Callum makes this sound like it's an absolute regular occurrence. Like, yeah, you go camping in Finland, you're going to get destroyed. Whereas, I don't think that's the reality. That was exactly what happens at Lake Bodum near the southern tip of the country, just a short drive from Helsinki. The name of that beautiful place will forever be synonymous with the terrible events that unfolded there 60 years ago. What began as a bloody story about an attack on a group of teens spun into the most enduring mystery in all of Finnish criminal history. The story of the Lake Bodum murders. The Crime Morning and Afternoon on the 4th of June 1960, a group of teenagers were riding on mopeds around the edge of Lake Bodum in southern Finland. These were, and you're really going to have to excuse my pronunciation here, yeah, you're going to have to excuse excuse my pronunciation a bunch through this video. Even Bodum, I looked it up on my pronunciation dictionary, it was said in a weird Finnish way, so I'm saying it as like the closest I can do in like with an English accent. Uh, okay, let's try these names. Melia, Mela, Imenli Bajorkland. Her boyfriend Niels Wilhelm Gustafsson, another couple called Anya Taliki, Mackie, and Seppo Antera Boisman. <laughs> oh man. I hope these guys have nicknames that we can use, Callum. Both of the girls were 15 years old, and the guys were 18. Yes, it was a different time. Uh, 1960s. Okay. Regardless, a questionable age gap is the least of our worries today. The two girls knew each other from vocational school, while the boys were both apprentices at a foundry. The campsite they chose for this weekend was at Hockness, a peninsula on the southern edge of the lake. Once they arrived there in the afternoon, they pitched their tent and settled in for a nice, relaxing day in nature, going swimming and fishing before the short Nordic nighttime set in. Oh, and the boys did a bit of drinking. It is Finland, after all. I didn't know that the Finns were particularly big drinkers, but there we go. Evening. It was around midnight by the time the group settled down to bed in their single tent. But we know from Mailer's journal that they weren't down for long. She wrote, Fifth day camping at Lake Bodum. Seppi and Nisse were drunk. Up at 2am, Seppi was fishing. It's thought that both of the boys were struggling to sleep, so decided to do a bit of late night angling to pass the time. Now, I don't actually remember what it's like to go outside, but I'm told it's beautiful. Yeah, if, uh, depending on where you're listening, when you're listening to this, we're recording this in uh, on the... 
28th of January 2020 and uh, 2021. I keep writing 2020 and wherever I, whenever I fill out a date form, but it is 2021 and COVID is still everywhere. I really look forward to going back outside and resuming my normal life. Not that I spend a lot of time outside anyway, because I just live in my studio or at home. But, you know, I like to have the option. <laughs> In such a lovely place surrounded by gorgeous scenery, all illuminated in the moonlight, the two boys must have been feeling pretty damn carefree. The vodka buzz probably helped, but mostly it was the scenery. When they were done, they returned to the campsite and crawled into bed to settle down for the night. Morning Scene It's now morning, and the peaceful scene of the evening prior has been replaced with one of pure horror. The tent has collapsed, its beige canvas soaked red with blood. Under the fabric, we can make out the form of two bodies. Another lies on top of the tent, Jan Mailer, naked from the waist down and disfigured from countless stab wounds. Of the four campers, only Nils Gustafsson is still alive. He lies unconscious outside the tent, suffering from similar head injuries to those that killed his friends and partner. Their skulls had been fractured from blunt force trauma, and knife wounds crisscrossed their arms. Gustafsson had survived the hits to the back of the head and jaw, but only just. Cerebral fluid was leaking from his nose. On top of that, there was a gash on his cheek so wide and deep that his teeth showed through it. Found. The scene I've just described is gruesome enough from a distance, but imagine actually coming across it in person. That's exactly what happened to Esko Johansson and his son, who had gone down to the lake to swim at around 11 a.m. Before diving in for a dip, they spotted the collapsed canvas in a clearing and went over to investigate, hopefully without his kid by his side. By 11.15, both of them were running back down to town as quickly as possible to call the police. While they were away, another man named Sigurd Volat... <laughs> Sigurd... Volasma stumbled across the same grisly site and went off to make the same phone call. When the authorities arrived, they were able to cart off Gustafsson to the hospital where he spent a few weeks recovering. The attacker had left him with a potential brain injury and therefore some pretty foggy memories about what exactly had gone down. Still, the police were able to get some key details from him with the help of hypnosis, a common police method at the time. His account of what happens would give rise to one of the most mystifying and infamous cases in Finnish history. Do they still use hypnosis? Is that actually a thing? Or was that, like, discredited? I feel like I've seen it in CSI or, like, in movies and stuff, but I can't imagine we're still actually hypnotizing people and expecting it to be real, right? Or is it? I, I don't know. I don't know. What happened? So what exactly do we know about what happened that night? How did a simple camping trip go so horribly wrong? But well, we can narrow down the time of the murders to sometime between 4 and 6 a.m. The short nights up this far north meant that an attacker would only have a limited window of opportunity if they wanted to work in secret before any early birds were out wandering the forest. That's exactly what happened at 6 a.m. It was about six decades before Fortnite, so young boys were still doing strange things like hiking and bird watching. <laughs> the past was the worst. <laughs> at least now we have video games to entertain us, and so it'd be like, oh look, the spotted crescent. <laughs> Two such young lads spotted the collapsed canvas tent from a distance on their morning stroll, but didn't really think anything of it. They reported seeing a blonde man walk away from the site at the time, but didn't think to call the police. As far as they knew, all they were seeing was the morning after a wild woodland vodka party. Probably not a rare sight out there on the weekends. If I saw a collapsed tent, though, I'd probably go over and investigate, I think. Although maybe I'd have got murdered because the murderer, if it's the blonde dude, definitely still seemed to be there. So maybe I'd be dead if I was this kid. Well, okay, let's move on. The blonde haired individual would be painted in greater detail by Gustafsson, who had the somewhat vague recollection of a man dressed in black staring down at him through a hole in the tent. Rather than coming through the entrance of the tent, this man had cut the guy ropes to ensnare the teens inside before stabbing and beating them through the fabric. A fisherman's son who had been angling relatively near to the campsite hadn't heard any commotion, but he did report seeing this mysterious mysterious blonde individual walking down a path that morning. Now I know what you're thinking, isn't everyone blonde in the Nordic countries? Well, sort of. We'll have to admit that it doesn't narrow things down that much. The only other details we have are that he was around 5'8 and likely in his 20s. An observant onlooker at the crime scene might have also noticed that this assailant had taken the wallets and the bike keys of the teens. I feel like any basic detective would have noticed, oh, their wallets are missing. Isn't that the number one thing that, you know, it's like, oh, Let's look for some ID. Oh, they haven't had their wallets. Okay, the wallets were stolen. Uh, some of their clothes were also missing. Were he to be caught with them in his possession, it would undoubtedly serve as conclusive proof. The Investigation 
But if it's conclusive proof you are looking for, then don't go calling the Finnish police circa 1960. As soon as they arrived at the scene, the chances of solving the crime actually plummeted rapidly, which is exactly the opposite of what I look for in a police force. It's what everyone, you know, what do we like the police to do? Solve crimes. What do we not like them to do? Not solve crimes. Easy. <laughs> A host of officers, search dogs, soldiers, and onlookers descended upon the area to contaminate the crime scene with all of their wayward trampling. Authorities never even bothered to set up any police tape to cordon off the area. What, did they just not think this was important? Oh yeah, like four teenagers were murdered. Ah, it's low list of priorities. <laughs> This meant that in the days which followed, any campers who hadn't heard the news could easily have come and set up on the very same spot. Even all you hard and outdoors folks out there would probably think twice about that. Despite the immediate parade of blunders, they were able to extract some interesting clues from the campsite. For one, Gustafsson's shoes had been recovered around half a kilometer from where the tent was pitched. As for the rest of the missing belongings, they were never recovered. The same was true of the murder weapons, thought to be a knife and a rock. The Finnish army Army conducted a thorough search of both the lake and the surrounding forest, but it seemed like the killer had taken both with him. However, he might have left one key clue behind, which turned up during the army's search. An empty drink bottle floating in the water near the campsite. Two fingerprints were lifted from it, and with that, the authorities were now hot on the trail of probably some random litterer who threw their coke bottle in the lake. Yeah, if that's the best evidence you got to go on, it's not, not a great start, is it, guys? Seems like the guys tasked with finding the missing objects felt that they needed to justify their job somehow. A little more substantially than that, and a hundred times more perplexing, was the pillowcase next to the tent, rolled up and held with an elastic band. Investigators found traces of blood and semen on the fabric, but peculiarly, none of these could be definitively linked to the victims. It's possible that a mix of multiple people's blood and or semen could have confused the results of the relatively rudimentary testing back then but we'll never know for sure. At the morgue, closer inspection of the bodies offered up nothing much more than some freshly horrific details. Boysman, for example, had suffered stab wounds on the neck, likely dying from blood inhalation. Bjorkland had defensive wounds on her arms. She had been stabbed around 15 times, some of them probably after she was already dead. As for the man who inflicted these wounds, officers spent the next several days searching the forest and setting up road checkpoints to try and find him. Their dragnet approach amazingly managed to net a full 88 wanted persons who had been roaming around out there in the countryside to the northwest of Helsinki. That's incredible. So they went looking for one person. They found 88 criminals who were just hiding in the woods. I mean, we start. I started off making fun of like, yeah, you're probably not going to run into any murderous criminals in the woods of Helsinki. Turns out, it's where all the criminals seem to go to hide. It's like Alaska. It's, it's uh, Finland's Alaska. That's pretty good going, but unfortunately, none of those captured were the mysterious murderer of the teens. All in all, around 4,000 people would be interviewed in the hope of finding him, and several likely candidates were identified. So who was the mystery blonde man? As I said before, when the police were trying to get a better description of what he might look like, they employed hypnosis on the survivor, Gustafsson. I feel 1960 got to be before like proper DNA evidence and stuff. I mean, I, were they doing some stuff with blood types back then? But if they've got the DNA, you know, uh, biological samples on the tent and of the victims, maybe they can find some DNA stuff later, run it through a database and see if the guy was ever arrested or anything. Who knows? Maybe we'll find out. He gave a description which was eerily similar to that of the fisherman's son, meaning that the sketch which the police had drawn up of a chisel-drawed man with high cheekbones and coiffed back hair was likely accurate. Suspects So let's arrange a lineup of all of the potential suspects. This is where things start to get even weirder, because we're about to meet some bizarre characters, most with extremely shady pasts. Well, I mean, if they're on the, the list of potential suspects for this horrific murder, they're probably not the best people in the world. <laughs> Just roaming around in the, in, in the Finland uh, wilderness, hoping not to be caught for previous crimes. The first promising candidate was one Pauli Kusta Luoma. This wasn't based on a likeness to the police sketch, but something even more obvious. A dust-covered Luoma had approached a carpenter who lived in the forest to ask for a cigarette at around 10 a.m. on the day after the murders. He had bloodstains on his arms and chest. Case closed, right? Yes, indeed, just not our case. See, Luoma was wanted by the police as he was an escapee from a labor facility at the time. He had a track record of robbery and theft, but was very unlikely to be the one who killed the teens at Lake Bodum. You see, he had a bulletproof alibi for that evening. It's likely the blood was just his own from whatever misadventures he went through during his getaway. I am truly amazed by the number of criminals hiding in Finland's woods. This is a whole new thing to me. 
So if it wasn't the escaped thief, how about an escaped psychopath? Are we serious? What is going on, Finland? All of your criminals are escaping and running off to the woods. Apparently, Finian Finland is just crawling with fugitives. Callum and I, same page. And it just so happens that another one was in the area at the time. This one was Penti Soinanen, then just 15 years old and on the run from his care home. Nobody really suspected him at the time, but as his violent offenses racked up over the following years, winning him a psychopathy diagnosis, officers interviewed him about the time near Lake Bodum. This proved fruitless, however, and Soinanen was ruled out as a suspect. He wasn't near the campsite on that night. Wasn't this years later? I'm always amazed. You know, when you're watching a TV show and the police are like, can you tell me where you were on the uh, 15th of February 2017? And the guy's like, yes, I was with my friend here. And I'll be like, I have no idea. I don't even know what, where I, I would have not the vaguest clue. And I'd look in my calendar, there'd probably be nothing on that day. And I'd be like, I guess I was at home. <laughs> We're now moving towards the two potential suspects who offer up the most for us to chew on. The first one is Valdemar Gilstrom, and I swear each new name is getting harder and harder to pronounce. It is Callum, I noticed. Instead, we'll just call him by a local nickname, Kiosk Man. That is a lot easier. That was understandable because he owned a kiosk in the nearby town of Oita, maybe, just a little west of where the campers were set up. Now, although Kiosk Man's name might just make him sound like a short-lived superhero from some crappy old comic, he was actually a well-known villain around town. Towns have villains? The world has actual villains? Isn't that just from, like, fiction? <laughs> he was a violent alcoholic, okay, this guy sounds pretty villainous, with a track record of aggression towards his wife and kids. Doubt to be getting a spot in the MCU anytime soon. More importantly, though, this villain was also known to hold a grudge against any and all campers in the area. Bloody campers. <laughs> Get off my grounds! You know the hillbilly at the start of a slash movie who tells the teens, We don't take kindly to new folks around these parts. Well, that was basically Gilstrom. This didn't just mean dishing out nasty glares either. He went as far as throwing rocks at visitors in the forest, putting razor blades inside apples, and cutting guy ropes. This, I don't know if this guy's the murderer, but either way, he does sound like an absolute dickhead. It seems there's a clear motive there then. A strange one, but a motive nonetheless. The guy just couldn't stand campers. Add to that the similar methodology to his past harassment, and it seems like we might have our man. This misguided guardian of the woods was one of the first people that the townsfolk cast their suspicions upon, leading the police to search his property. I mean, the, the stuff about like the cutting the guy ropes and stuff, and like throwing rocks... That doesn't sound like the worst in the world, but dude, putting razor blades in apples? What is actually wrong with you? That makes me think that you could be a bit of a murderer. As it turns out, in the time between the murders and their search, Kiosk Man had reportedly f filled in a well on his property with dirt. Although the police never came up with any of the missing objects during their search, years later, his son-in-law maintained that he was certain they were buried down there. His wife, on the other hand, argued for his innocence. <laughs> Son's betraying him. He's like, yeah, no. It was him. Well, he also wasn't he. He was a violent, uh, a violent alcoholic towards them. So I guess uh, who could blame him? Told the police that he couldn't have committed the murders because they were at home together that whole evening. It's thought by some that her defense of kiosk men caused the police to wrap up their search much faster than they should have. Perhaps they really had found their guy and they let him slip by. Can you? Is the is the wife a reliable alibi? Like, can, do police have to trust like? alibis like that ah uh, that seems a bit dodgy even if that were the case there's zero chance of him ever standing trial in 1969 the kiosk man walked into lake bodum and drowned himself damn it's not how i would choose to go it's like how did you kill yourself oh yeah i just swam out into a lake and drowned why hans ass man <laughs> really it's actually spelt a-s-s-m-a-n-n if you thought that last entry was pretty wild, the next one is a cut above. Our second prime suspect was a 36-year-old German man named Hans Arsman. Simmer down, we're all grown-ups here. Ah, <laughs> oh, Callum, you make me feel like I have a juvenile sense of humor, which I absolutely do. Hans also lived in Espoo. <laughs> really? The Arsman lives in Espoo? Spelt E-S-P-O-O. -O. 
Uh, just a few miles from the scene of the crime, and he had even more local legends woven around him than our last maniac. One was that he had been a prison guard at Auschwitz during World War II, although that kind of rumor was probably spread about to every German expat in those days. A more believable story, though, is that he once belonged to the Luftwaffe. After his death, his sister produced proof that he had, in fact, received a full pension from them. He wasn't shooting down fighter planes in the last years of the war, however. Those he spent inside a Soviet POW camp after being captured in 1943. People in Euter believed that during this time, Hans was recruited as a spy by the KGB. Wow, they really didn't like this guy. <laughs> in terms of, like, negative things that you could be in the in the 19th, in the the 20th century, it's like, yeah, no, I was a Nazi. I was specifically a guard at Auschwitz. That's fairly low. And it's like, what's next? Oh, yeah, I was a spy. I'm a spy for the KGB. Brilliant. Again, I should probably state that this kind of rumor was likely not exactly novel in a country which was always on high alert against Russia, especially at the height of the Cold War. Yeah, this does kind of sound embellished a bit, doesn't it? At the same time in the West, the FBI were keeping tabs on anyone they even suspected of having communist sympathies, ready to give them a kick with the steel-toed jackboot of freedom. Finns and Americans alike were being extra paranoid about the Red Terror to the East, so it's very possible that Hans was actually just your everyday average Joe ex-Nazi. <laughs> that being said, the KGB angle might not be so fantastical after all. See, there's this other little detail that might lend the rumor some credence. When Hans returned to Germany after his release in 1945, he met a Finnish woman named Vienno, who would eventually go on to marry. She was also a suspected spy on account of the fact that she assumed false names when she visited various countries and nobody could quite understand why. That does sound very spy-like. And like moving around hotels was another one. What was the casual criminalist episode where there was the guy who they thought was, or the girl who they thought was a spy and kept changing names and moving around? It's, it's spy behavior. It is definitely spy behavior. Or maybe just someone who likes anonymity. But never mind that. We're looking for a murderer. We're not hunting down KGB spies. That's my day job. And I don't really like talking shop after I clock off. As it turns out, we also have plenty of reasons to suspect that Hans was responsible for the Lake Bodum killings. He turns up to the Helsinki General Hospital on the 6th of June, acting strangely. His clothes were stained red, and it appeared that there was dirt under his fingernails. While doctors were preparing to treat him for an unknown ailment, he pulled some weird stuff like pretending to fall unconscious and throwing abuse at the staff. More importantly, though, he fit the description of the mystery blonde man to a T. A future university professor, Jorma Padlo, was the doctor assigned to see him, and he was convinced that he had found the guy from the radio reports. He called the police, who came in to interrogate Hans. Amazingly, though, they never thought to take away his blood-stained clothes for analysis. They just reported that Arsman had a strong alibi which exempted him from suspicion. What was that alibi? Well, at first, it was deemed of such a sensitive nature that it couldn't be made public. Is he a spy? But court documents later revealed that the situation was that he was getting some, as the kids say. So why didn't the police just... This <laughs> doesn't seem like, in the grand scheme of things, very sensitive. Uh, the married assman was off in Helsinki staying at an apartment with his side chick. Her landlord backed this story up by saying that he saw the two of them at breakfast time. Apparently, the hostess had woken up at 6 a.m. to prepare the morning meal and aroused the lovebirds at 9 a.m. to come down for coffee. If Hans were to have snuck out to commit a murder, he'd have to have had the stealth skills of, oh, I don't know, a KGB spy. Oh, my. Yeah, again, not rock solid, is it? But, I mean, interesting suspect. And I get the feeling because this piece is titled Finland's Biggest Mystery rather than Finland's Biggest Mystery was solved when the case was concluded that we're not going to find out what happens here, so we're just left with speculation anyway. As for the red stains on his clothing, he explained that to the police, saying it was the result of some drunken home decorating at a job site. <laughs> Dr. Paller wasn't convinced, though. Even decades later, when writing books on the case, he maintained that Asman really was covered in blood and the police made a fatal misstep, taking him at his word. Why would you take him at his word, police? Come on, do your job. It's like, no, 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 I definitely didn't kill, 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 kill those kids. And all of this red stuff on my clothes is paint. Like, I don't know. I've had blood on clothes and I've had paint on clothes. It's really different. It's really very different. Even if you don't have this magical, like, future technology to test it on, I feel like you'd be like, smells painty, <laughs> smells bloody. 
And most importantly of all, he looked so unbelievably like the police photo fit, you'd have thought he would have posed for the sketch. Surely nobody is that unlucky, right? This must have been the man the witnesses saw. He coincidentally changed his hairstyle not long after the description went public, but the rest was a strong match. Guilty. Seems mega guilty. <laughs> For all you Assman apologists out there, however, there remains some reasons to doubt that it really was him who was seen there. See, Alavi Kivlati, the fisherman's son, didn't have the best eyesight. He was nearsighted and estimated that the mystery man passed at a distance of about 50 meters. It's possible that at least some of the details he gave were him just filling in the blurry blanks. Is it possible that he already had the image of the local legend Hans Arsman in his mind when doing so? It is a stretch, but stranger things have happened. But how then would the victim Gustafsson have been able to give a matching description with his recollections? Well, maybe they weren't really his recollections after all. Neuroscientists have gone on the record to state that this kind of amnesia he was suffering from could not have been bypassed using hypnosis, as was carried out by the police. Um, I think the only response there is shocking. Had he somehow found out about the description of the blonde man given by the fisherman's son? It's unlikely, and would have required some major slip of the tongue on the police's side. Still, it's not entirely outside the realms of possibility. Even if that were the case, though, what would Gustafsson's incentive be to lie about the whole thing? Well, we're actually not at the end of our lineup of suspects just yet. There's one final, unlikely addition that we need to consider. The Surprise Arrest It's now 44 years after the murder, March 2004. Most have given up hopes of finding any conclusive resolution to the story, and its one survivor is now in his 60s. The Finnish public was shocked when, with little warning, Gustafsson himself was brought in by the police and charged with a horrible crime committed against his friends all those years ago. They, he's, this, it's 44 years later. I mean, maybe there's not a statute of limitations for murder, but it seems like a really long time ago. Although, yes, I'm, feeling here, I'm feeling a bit sorry for this old man, but then again, no, he committed a horrible murder. <laughs> he should definitely go to prison if he's guilty. It doesn't matter if it's been 44 years. It was a, a multiple murder. This new development was based on modern forensic analysis of a key piece of evidence, the shoes found stashed 500 meters away from the campsite. Remember I told you that old-timey blood analysis would struggle to extract anything useful from a cocktail of different samples mixed together? Well, modern analysis has no such drawbacks. Yeah, 44 years of technology. Uh, technological improvement really going to make a big difference. It found that Gustafsson's footwear had on it the blood of the three other victims, but none from the man himself, suggesting whoever had committed the crime would have likely been wearing them at the time. This and some undisclosed new DNA evidence led to the spinning of a new narrative in which Gustafsson had come into conflict with his friends, enacted a horribly bloody and disproportionate yeah, no kidding, revenge, and finally went to extreme lengths to cover up his crime. After spending 59 days in jail waiting to discover what would happen to him, Gustafsson was released when the judge deemed him not to be a flight risk. He would have to wait another 14 months, however, before getting to properly defend himself against the accusations in court. The trial commenced on August the 4th, 2005. The Trial As I said, the prosecution's case rested on the shoes. Not only was there no blood from Gustafsson on them, but there were some striking blood patterns which seemed to prove beyond a doubt that the killer was wearing them during the murder, a fact long assumed by investigators. This meant that either a raging town drunk or KGB hatchet man decided to swap shoes with the 18-year-old before killing him and his friends, or that the killer was actually the rightful owner of said shoes. It was also suggested that it was Gustafsson who the two young birdwatchers spotted leaving the camp early that morning. He was the tall blonde figure heading off to hide the evidence of his crime in the woods. Without an obvious motive to go on, the prosecution essentially whipped one up out of a few limited ingredients. Regardless, it's certainly worth hearing them out. See, a new witness had just come forward to tell of how, when they went off walking alone, Gustafsson and Boisman had stumbled across another campsite a mile or so round the lake. The witness was a woman who was staying there, and she said she spoke to the young men that night. Apparently, Gustafsson had overindulged on the alcohol and was trying to fight his mate. Still, how many of you have gotten into a shouting match with a friend over a few vodkas? That's standard UK pub behavior, and not necessarily proof of murderous intentions. Yeah, every time I had a go at a friend after a few beers and then didn't murder them, you know, that's fairly normal. How about proof of a guilty conscience, though? 
It was alleged that two different individuals had actually heard the accused admit his guilt in the years which followed the crime. One was a lead investigator, although the statement Gustafsson made in front of him was so vague that it didn't prove much. Another was a female acquaintance who said she'd overheard him bragging about escaping justice around a decade later. That about accounts for all of the major pieces of evidence, so let's take a look at the narrative which was pieced together from them. Sometime in the evening, Gustafsson made sexual advances on Bajorkland, who rejected them. He wasn't happy, and his resulting outburst caused the others to kick him out of the tent. Rather than settling down for a drunken sleep on the ground, Gustafsson returned shortly after and was confronted by Boisman. The two got into a fight, and the suspected murderer ended up getting a good smacking, potentially causing his broken jaw and other facial fractures. Wow. He had, isn't this the guy who had cerebral fluid leaking through his brain? He got an absolute beatdown. <laughs> Still, shouldn't be laughing about that. Still not content to just chalk up the night as a loss, Gustafsson returned a second time. Now he was armed with a knife in one hand and a rock in the other. It was he who cut the ropes, then fell upon the trio in a frenzy of striking and stabbing. It's possible that one of them managed to kick out through the canvas, scoring another hit to his face, which would have been the cause of his injuries. Okay, I mean, even so, this guy was out for 40-something years, you know, free in the world afterwards. Surely if you are this temperamental, like you get drunk and get into a fight and you murder three people, you're going to have a criminal record afterwards because this isn't the sort of thing you just do once, right, and then are a perfect law-abiding citizen forever. After the heaped mass under the tent stopped moving, Gustafsson enacted perhaps the most sadistic part of his revenge. He kept stabbing at the body of Bajorkland, twisted retribution for rejecting him earlier. All in all, he stabbed her 15 times. After the fog cleared, Gustafsson realized he would soon be in trouble when the day-trippers returned to the forest. Thinking fast, he decided to grab various items from the victims to imitate a robbery. He did away with them somewhere nobody would ever find them, and who knows where, because while well, nobody ever found them. Before getting rid of the knife, he proceeded to carve his own body to simulate an attack on himself. With that taken care of, he returned to the tent shoeless before lying down and waiting for the police to eventually arrive. Medical expert witnesses were called by the prosecution to argue that he had in fact exaggerated the scale of his injuries at the time. This allowed him to cast himself as an innocent, a traumatized victim for over four decades before the law finally caught up with him. Again, this is the prosecution side of things, and I would say, yes, it all fits together rather nicely. Um, but I'm say, uh, you know, I personally have doubts, and also, you know, I'm assuming in Finland you've got to prove your all, all reasonable doubts, and this doesn't seem very likely, does it? Anyway, let's move on to the defense. So that is a good story. If it really is the case, then Gustafsson would have to be one of the most ruthless, quick-thinking, and devious killers we've ever covered on this show. But the defense team had plenty lined up to try and prove that this wasn't the case. They argued, for example, that if the drunken teen had really taken a beating strong enough to break his facial bones up, then he would struggle to take on three people in a scuffle, even given the fact that they were stuck in the tent. I don't know if you've ever been punched before, but it really hurts. Is it really believable that with such a mix of head trauma, self-inflicted wounds, and drunkenness, Gustafsson would have had the energy and presence of mind to execute such an expert cover-up? And never mind a punch to the face, we already know that the man had some pressing medical emergencies to deal with, namely the gaping hole in his face and the crack to the back of his skull. The defense called their own medical witnesses to counter the claims of exaggeration. They presumably just took the stand for a few seconds to say, mate, there was literally brain juice dripping out of his nose. Okay, I'm glad that the defense brought this up, because <laughs> it's like he was seriously injured. I mean, if younger Gustafsson was able to fake those symptoms, he must have had no problem pulling a sick year at school. And on top of that, his broken jaw and facial bones matched those of the other victims, meaning they were all likely done with the same technique and weapon, and most importantly, from the same angle. This is a bloody good defense. The blood evidence offered up some similar support. The accused's blood was inside the tent too, meaning he was either attacked while sleeping next to his friends, or the prosecution's alleged scuffle happened inside. Also, the rest of his clothing was curiously absent of any blood splatters like those which peppered his shoes. And remember the new DNA evidence teased by the police in the lead-up to the trial? Well, it never really materialized in any significant way. The mystery pillowcase with traces of blood and semen wasn't even included, as it continued to stump pretty much everyone involved. So much so that it seemed they were all content just to pretend it didn't exist for the sake of convenience. 
Then there's the logical issues with the narrative itself. If Gustafsson really wanted to hide the shoes, why not dispose of them in the same way as the still missing objects? How did he walk all the way back to the camp without leaving dirt all over his relatively clean socks, or at least on his feet? And if he really was acting out of frustrated rage, why would the woman that rejected him get a worse attack than the man who had humiliated him and beat him down? To top it all off, the fisherman's son who gave the report of the strange blonde man was adamant that it was not Gustafsson. The bird watchers, given the fact they caught a fleeting glimpse could neither confirm nor deny this is a solid defense there's no way that this guy even if he is guilty this defense is so solid that i don't know if they have judges or juries in finland whoever that is it that defense is solid result You'll have noticed that I just sprinkled in enough seeds of doubt to grow a whole bloody orchard. And that typically doesn't go well for the prosecution. In a resolution issued on the 7th of October 2005, Judge Lama Heki Mikola acquitted Gustafsson of all the charges. The jury, so they do have a jury, there you go. The jury asserted that there was simply not enough evidence to prove the prosecution's narrative, which seems pretty clear given all the unresolved questions. Gustafsson raised another court case seeking compensation for his imprisonment, eventually managing to get just shy of 45,000 euros for his trouble, not bad for a couple of months' work. He believed he was still due more compensation for dragging his name through the mud. I kind of agree. And yeah, that's a lot of money for like two months that he was incarcerated or whatever while awaiting trial. But I mean, the stress of that must have been intense <laughs> especially after living with this horrible thing for your whole life i can't believe the police even took it to court with this like scant evidence throughout the whole affair especially when the dna it just turned out oh yeah we didn't really have the whole thing that we started basing this extra trial on it's like come on throughout the whole affair the tabloids had been plastering his face all over the front pages and speculating on his guilt he understandably wanted to have a go at those vultures as well, but his request to sue for defamation was denied. That surprises me. I feel like that would have been fair. Consider for a second what we've just seen unfold. It's very likely that based on some paper-thin evidence and investigative hunches, the sole survivor of a brutal knife attack was hauled off to court to be accused of the crime. Over the course of the affair, he even had to look at the same tent in which the bodies of his friends and girlfriend once lay, pitched once again inside the courtroom. Assuming he really is innocent, 45,000 euros seems like a majorly cheap payout for all of that stress. Again, Callum and I are on the same page about that one. Kiosk Man Returns so that was a surprising little detour ride, but it was a dead end, as it turned out. So, well, where do we go from here? Well, it's worth retreating to some old grounds before we finish, as I'm not quite done with our diabolical duo of suspects from before. First, let's return to our first suspect, the Kiosk Man 2, sociopathic boogily. <laughs> As it happens, Gustafsson wasn't the only person who reported to have confessed to the crimes. Kiosk Man also took the blame during several conversations with acquaintances, the last being a drunken exchange with his neighbor at a sauna one evening in 1969. It just so happens that he killed himself the very next day. Police had followed up on these reports over the years, but gave little credence to them, as the man was known to be extremely troubled. They just assumed that this famously drunken, violent guy was being a drunken, violent idiot. It is possible that he was just leaning into the townsfolk's existing suspicions for reasons which probably only make sense to the sort of people who hide razor blades in apples. Yes, something clearly not right with this dude. You might not be so fast to let him off the hook, however, when you hear that his wife, who had originally given him his bulletproof alibi, revealed that she had only done so because Kiosk Man threatened to kill her if she didn't comply. This is why, when I mentioned earlier, you shouldn't rely on the wife for an alibi. Especially when you know the husband beats the wife. Jesus, police, come on. Really, she had no idea where he was. None of this inspired any major action from detectives. Why not? You took the victim to court and dragged him through the mud on some wrong dna evidence so you have to wonder if this was maybe just a case of idle town gossip being jumped up by the press it's not like kiosk man was short of any enemies after all one of his most vocal opponents was a local politician ulf johansson who later wrote a book called oh my legendum on bottom arthur Dreyer something something never mind he wrote a book all right and it's probably something about the legend of bodum i'm guessing legenden Le legenden means legend he put forward the case for the ornery shopkeeper's guilt. Within its pages, he purported to prove that this violent local nuisance had previously been committed to a mental institution. Safe to say that his name is still in competition for that top spot in the list of suspects. The Arse Man Cometh And contestant number two, as we all know, 
is everyone's favorite possible KGB agent and brilliantly named man, Hans Arseman. The model Aryan has been the subject of the majority of the cold case digging over the years. And as it turns out, he was an even more suspicious character than we first thought. We first thought he was a KGB spy. How much more suspicious do you get? And an Auschwitz guard. <laughs> The Germans' brushes with the law in the years before and after the killings reveal a character who had a strong propensity for violence. For example, in 1961, the police jailed him for severely beating his wife Vienna in public, kicking her even after she fell down in pain. Thankfully, Vienna was able to get out of that horrific situation after another nine long years. Oh, God. Free of Hans's control, she revealed that he often spent time in the area where the crimes occurred, meaning he was very familiar with the terrain. If local suspicions are to be believed, he was also no stranger to murder. He was a person of interest in the murder of a teenage girl killed in a hit-and-run while riding her bicycle, and in another case where two young girls were killed while camping. I have no my desire to go camping in Finland. I mean, I didn't have one already, but I thought, you know, you think that would be nice. And I'm like, hard pass. <laughs> There's way too many crimes and murderers. If the perpetrator of the Lake Bodum murders when was an experienced killer who knew how the investigation might go, perhaps some of the evidence, such as Gustafsson's shoes, was intended to divert the police's attention. This is just speculation, of course, so let me give you something a little more concrete. Ooh. Hans Arsman passed away in 1997, but before he did, he called a journalist to his sickbed to record his memoirs. The result was a book which detailed the often cryptic conversations which transpired between the two. When asked about the Lake Bowden murders, Hans replied, I suppose you expect me to talk about those tent and knife things. I have to disappoint you. I will not speak about the details. I will not admit nor deny things. Not a solid no by any means there, even on his deathbed with nothing to lose but perhaps his reputation, he wouldn't confirm either way. This intentional ambiguity drew the renewed ire of the public, who laid into the police for not pursuing the angle properly. Then, when unsealed court documents revealed that his supposedly rock-solid alibi turned out to be a pinky promise from the landlord and hostess, distant relatives of Hans, don't trust people's relatives for alibis. Come on. The authorities were slaughtered in the papers. Another book was released a few years later, which added fresh fuel to the fire and crystallized a bizarre theory which had slowly been gaining credence as the years went on. It was written by Professor Jorma Parlow. He never quite forgot his encounter with the man on that strange evening at the hospital in 1960. A full 43 years later, he ended up publishing a book giving a rundown of all the evidence to suggest Arsman's guilt. The doctor revealed that he kept the clothing left behind by the German and was astounded that the police never came back to retrieve it. His most shocking assertion of all, though, was that the KGB rumors surrounding Arsman were all true. This meant he secretly enjoyed immunity for the crimes for the sake of diplomacy with the USSR. That sounds pretty outlandish, and it was condemned as such by the Finnish authorities. However, given the climate of the 1960s and Finland in general having just settled into their own conflict with the Ruskies a couple of decades prior, it's pretty obvious that there would at least be some KGB spies dotted around the country. By 1980, it's thought that the Soviets had over 200 operatives in the country. The only question is, was this particular guy one of them? And if so, was he able to leverage his position to avoid prison? We'll never know for sure, but I'd like to leave you with one last image to ponder. In the early 2000s, a picture from the joint funeral of the Lake Bodum victims surfaced. Among the packed crowd, a face is visible. Chiseled jaw, blonde hair, sharp cheekbones. It's hard not to conclude that this very well could be Hans Arsman himself attending the funeral of the Helsinki kids, despite having no good reason to be there. If the image of a murderous KGB spy attending the funeral of three teens who he may just have brutally slaughtered just days earlier doesn't send a chill down your spine, I don't know what will. Yes, that is incredibly disturbing, and that guy, allegedly, I don't know, he seems like the most likely, doesn't he? And they just left him alone. That is bizarre, and uh, yeah, disappointing. Wrap up. By this point, you're probably pretty much up to date with the story, and sadly, there's still no proper resolution. It's easy to see why it's such an enduring case in Finnish culture, but unless we get some more deathbed confessions or the like, it looks set to remain as cold as a Nordic winter. In the absence of any convictions, we're left with three main theories. One, famous anti-camper Kioskman finally went too far with his campaign of terror. Two, the only survivor was the culprit and managed to wangle out of a conviction in court. Not likely. And three, an undercover KGB agent who once fought for the Axis powers leveraged his sway with the Russians to dodge arrest for his violent crimes. I can't believe I'm saying this. But number three is possibly the most likely. Let me know what you think, or if you think there's another possibility which may have slipped the attention of all of us. I'm with Callum on this one. 
I think it's the KGB spy. I mean, there's the least information around that one, so maybe there would be, and there wasn't a defense for him put forward in court and all of that stuff. But he, yeah, number three, right? Who knows, maybe the Finns will give you a nice shiny medal for breaking the case. One last thought. For any of you out there with a bit of an outdoors phobia, I apologize for sending that into overdrive today. Just remember the vast majority of camping trips are nothing but roasted marshmallows in good times. Still, there's no way in hell you'll catch me out there anytime soon. No, I'm suddenly like, I don't want to go camping, especially in Finland. And I enjoy camping. Dismembered appendices. If the name of the lake has been ringing bells for you throughout, a Finnish band from the Espoo area named Inearthed was looking for a new moniker after signing with a record label. They turned to a local phone book for inspiration and chose a certain location with strong macabre credentials. The headbangers out there will better know them as children of Bodom. Number two. If you have time for a deep dive into an absolutely bizarre biography, consider looking even further into the life and times of Hans Arsman. In the aforementioned book, he apparently verified that he had in fact been an Auschwitz guard and an SS trooper, but grew, grew disillusioned with Nazism when he fell in love with a Jewish woman. This led to his exile to the Eastern Front and subsequent capture. Unless the journalist was taking some major artistic license, the KGB angle isn't so wild after all. So, that's where we leave things today. I think number three is so much more likely. It's definitely not. I don't think it's number one. I don't think it's number two. I think maybe it's number three. Or maybe it's just completely unsolved and it was something else entirely. As always, this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a listener of this show, please do consider leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a viewer of this show on YouTube, smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Tell a friend. Well, you can tell a friend if you're listening as well. Why not tell a friend? I see people sharing this on social media, and I like it. I'm uh, at Simon Whistler. If you want to tag me when you share it, that would be welcome. And thank you for watching or listening.